Twas the night before Christmas, and all through Goulet, not a pen was stirring, not even Monteverde. The pilots were washed by the sink with care, in hopes that USPS soon would be there. The Penablers were nested all snug in their beds, while visions of ink samples danced in their heads. And Mom in her kerchief, and I in my cap, had just settled our wallets for a long winter's nap. When out on the porch there arose such a clatter, I sprang from the bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters and threw up the sash. The moon on the breast of the new fallen snow gave the luster of midday to my pens below, when what to my wondering eyes should appear but a miniature truck and a weary-eyed carrier. With a little old driver so lively around the corner, I knew in a moment it must be my order. More rapid than eagles, my gin house they came. And he whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Lamy, now Noodlers, now Platinum and Visconti, on Culliverse, on Conklin, on Penider and Edison. On top of the bottle, to the top of the page, now right away, right away, right away all. Hi everybody, Ryan Goulet here, episode number 237 of Goulet Q&A. And I really hope you enjoyed this one. We went for a, uh, a Christmassy theme here because this is the last Goulet Q&A that we will have for the year 2018. And I thought we'd do something kind of sentimental. So I got my Christmas sweater on, my sweater themed cup. And we're gonna go on a little journey together <laughs> as we talk about the questions that you all had for me this week. Starting out, some of the things that I've had going on. Um, I had my uncle's funeral this past weekend, which was kind of sad, but also uh, very honoring of his life. So that was a little, little bit tough um, in the midst of the holidays and everything. Rachel ended up planning a lot of it and all that. So that was tough, but it was really good to see family. Um, Rachel and I also had our choir concert, was to, which was through our church, which was supposed to be the previous weekend, but was delayed because of snow. So it ended up being a very busy weekend for us, reading right up into the holidays. Um, I also have my daughter's birthday coming up this coming weekend. We got family coming into town. It's going to be a whole big thing. So it's going to be very busy for us, but it's for all the right reasons. So that's kind of cool. Um, our, my team got caught up this week. Man, it's been crazy. Like we had a very busy, very fruitful holiday season. And just thank you all for supporting us and our team being patient as we've had a higher than expected volume and had some curveballs thrown our way, like weather and you know various other family life things going on with people. Um, but uh, my team's been working super, super hard. And it's been amazing to see everybody diving in uh, and helping out to get your orders out to you in time for the holidays. Um, unfortunately, we do not have any more of the Twisby pastel ecos because they are gone and I just found out uh, that we're not getting any more so my apologies if you thought that we were going to get more we never know with these special edition things if we're going to get more or not that wasn't even a US special edition that was a Chinese special edition we happened to get a, like one order a few of them and now they're gone so I apologize uh, what else we got Colorburst came out with a limited edition set which is kind of interesting. And honestly, we didn't even know internally if this would be something that anyone would want. So it comes in this case and it's called the standard model. And it comes in this little case, which is pretty cool. A lot of people are talking about like, looks like a portable drill case or something, <laughs> but it has this whole little color set here. And it's a, um, all, all new colors, all, um, you know, I guess they're calling them the standard because it's meant to be kind of an assortment of standard colors, if you will bunch of different colors going on here. Um, we haven't swabbed them up or anything because they're limited and we didn't know how long they were going to be around. Us swabbing colors, it's a lot of time, a lot of work, right in our busiest time of year. So I don't know how long we'll have these. It won't be for that long because they only made, I think, 200 sets total. And we're not the only colorless retailer in the world, so we're not going to have but so many of them. But anyway, it's a pretty interesting set, so I thought you'd just want to at least see what it looks like. We also got in the Stipula, Stipula Etruria Magma, um, which we've been waiting for for quite some time. Really beautiful looking pen. Uh, we also got Monteverde Rodeo Drive Polaris, which if you have looked at any of the other kind of iridescent uh, colors like the Northern Lights Regatta, it's got kind of that similar coloration to it. So um, the Rodeo Drive is a pen that we haven't had a whole lot of them. We had some limited colors available, but this is the first one in that 
Polaris color, so I think you'll like that. We had the Invincia in that same uh, Polaris color too, which has been pretty popular. So we thought, let's try the Rodeo Drive too. Uh, and then Banu, we're getting in some new hexagon colors, expanding the line a little bit, because um, I actually really dig the hexagon color. I think you'll like it. So I don't know if we'll have those in by Friday, hopefully, but we'll see. They're definitely on the way. And then a um, couple things that we have coming. This will be not immediately, but maybe in the next uh, week or two. Um, I think, I don't know exactly. We're still waiting on the shipment to come in in full, but we have um, a couple of books, which I have right here by... Andy Lambrow, um, legend in the pen world. So he has two books, Fountain Pens of the World and Fountain Pens of Japan. And it's really kind of a cool story how we came about getting these. I've actually known Andy, um, not intimately, but known of Andy for years. Um, picked up these books a couple of years ago. They're tremendous, tremendous resources. Like if you are into fountain pens, um, this is a book that is definitely worth getting. So it's just got tons and tons of pictures, tons of models, all kinds of history, a backstory of the companies and the packaging, and that's my sheets that I'm reading from here. <laughs> all kinds of amazing information, tons of pictures and drawings and advertisements and stuff of, of pens. So if you're, if, you're into, uh, if you're into that kind of stuff, it's pretty phenomenal. Self-published and um, tremendous resource there. So they're not super cheap because they're huge and they're colorful and um, not super widely distributed. Um, but we will have them for, we'll have two versions of it. We'll have a standard version, which is um, 135, and then a limited edition signed version, which will be 175. So if you're interested in that, check it out. I'm super pumped to be able to offer these. And the story of how we got them was interesting. I've had these for years and I had them on my shelf. I got in a, another random book, a uh, Pelican book, and I Instagram storied it on my personal Instagram. And uh, Stephen Brown, our, our lo beloved SBRE Brown on YouTube and Instagram, uh, messaged me and he was like, hey, you know, these are awesome. You totally could sell these. And I was like, what do you mean? Because I've only seen Andy sell them at shows. He's like, yeah, you know, a couple of the retailers have had them. And I was like, I've never even thought to reach out to Andy before to see if he would offer them. Uh, and so lo and behold, that's how it goes sometimes. You would think it would be such an obvious thing that I would think of, but mad props to Steven um, for prompting me on that one. But uh, now, now we'll have them. So that's kind of cool. Um, I've, I'm always excited to be able to link up with other like people that have contributed very meaningfully to the pen community and Andy's definitely one of those people that has done that. So very honored to have these books. Uh, and I hope that they are meaningful to you and that they don't sell out immediately and then I have a hard time getting them because that could happen. Um, I do want to talk to you because we're going to be closed next Monday and Tuesday. So we're actually going to be closed through the weekend and then Monday and Tuesday. So we'll be off completely inaccessible for four days so that our teams can spend time with their families. Um, so that's happening. And we have some products that are coming up here um, that I think at this point, it's hard to say what's actually going to come in because, you know, our shipping deadlines have all hit and everything for the holidays. So a lot of our suppliers and vendors are closing down for the end of the year, doing physical inventory, these types of things. So a lot of the, the shipping dates and stuff that we have are totally up in the air. But some of the things that I know are going to be forthcoming next, um, we're going to be getting a Retro 51 Space Pen restock, but that's probably going to be a couple weeks from now in January. Um, and that is going to be the last shipment we're going to have. So we're figuring out how to do that because we know the demand is really hot for those. Um, Pilot is coming out with their Vanishing Point Stripes. We were hoping we could get them in before they shut down, um, and it doesn't look like that's going to happen. So it's probably going to be in January when those come. Pelican Edelstein Garnet is going to be coming out at some point. Again, I don't know when. Conklin Crescent. So the Crescent Filler, it's, it's an iconic pen from Conklin, and we just haven't had it for some reason. So we're trying the black with the rose gold. They have other colors too, um, but that pen in particular, we're just gonna, gonna give it a shot and see if it's something you're interested in. We don't have any Crescent Fillers right now, um, and we thought maybe it's something that we could just test and offer to you and see if it's something that you want. Maybe I felt inspired by looking through some of these vintage books and just seeing like, dang, this, this Crescent, like it was from 1903. Like that pen has been around for a long time. Um, but obviously these were the new ones. Uh, and then Aurora is coming out with their anniversary edition, the Internationale. So a whole new model of Aurora. We should hopefully have that in our hands and we can show it off a little bit. But that's what we got going on. Definitely slowing down now on the new product thing um, because we've been kind of busy the last few weeks and we're gonna take a little break. All right, 
So let's get into it for this week's questions, shall we? It's going to be a little low-key one, but uh, I do have some really good, interesting stuff, especially if you're into the, the business-y kind of questions. I have some really good ones at the end that I hope to um, inspire you before we take a break because Q&A is not going to be happening next week. We are going to have a special surprise video in there for you next week, um, but no normal Q&A because we're closed for half the week. All right. First question I have is a pen and writing question. This is from J.M. Jongjim Jongmin on Instagram. Platinum has a 100th anniversary coming up. Would you expect something amazing like Pilot? Or maybe not, because I read on the website that the 3776 century was supposed to be somewhat of a representation of it. Um, actually, it's good you asked this, and part of why I wanted to take this question is because just this week, they announced what their 100th anniversary pens were going to be. Um, it's definitely a different vibe than what Pilot put out. Pilot went heavy into the um, Makie and Yurushi uh, route, because that's a very rich part of their history. Platinum dug into their history, which is very different uh, in some ways, even though they're both from Japan. They're not that far from each other in the grand scheme of things, but um, they do have uh, some different histories. So Platinum has announced two 100th anniversary pens that are similar but slightly different. Um, so they're inspired from a pen that they hold, had called the Platinum Platinum, which is from 1967. The founder, Shunichi Nakata, uh, created the first all-platinum nib in 1967 on this pen, the Platinum Platinum. Um, and, and apparently it was very difficult to produce at the time. So they're coming out with a pen, the 100th anniversary pen, called the Platinum Century The Prime. Um, which is going to be made of solid platinum. Platinum body, platinum trim, platinum nib, solid platinum. It's obviously going to be very expensive because platinum's not cheap, nor is it easy to work in. So that pen is going to be kind of the flagship 100th anniversary pen. They're only making 100 of them, and it's a list price of $14,000. Now, that's not necessarily going to be practical for everyone, and we have it, uh, I think we have it listed on our site at this point, so you can go and check it out. Beautiful looking pen, very different styling obviously than um, what, what Pilot did for their 100th anniversary, um, but still very cool in its own right. Um, they're doing a different version of it that's a more affordable one that's made of sterling silver instead of solid platinum. Um, and it has a gold nib instead of a platinum nib for only $1,400 list price. Um, and it's backfilled with like a black ink inside the um, kind of checkerboard pattern that they have there. So, or the lattice pattern, excuse me. So very cool, um, different style than what Pilot created, but it really speaks to the history that Platinum had. They dug into their, their founding and, and didn't try to just copy something that Pilot was doing. Um, and they have a much smaller presence in the US than uh, Pilot and Amiki, so I think their anniversary is gonna probably just make less of a splash in the US than Pilots did. Um, and I haven't heard anything yet of like a lower priced anniversary pen, like if they're gonna do a, a special 3776 or something like that. Um, but then again, I only heard about these ones this week. So it could be that there's more coming and I'm just not aware of it. Um, but so far that's what has been announced. So there will be some of those. I don't know how many of the sterling silver, the primes that they're going to make, um, but I would think it's going to be more than 100. So you can check out more information on those on our site. I think the availability of those is going to be in the February time frame, if I'm uh, correct, because February is when their anniversary is. All right, I got an ink question. This is from Marie H. on Facebook. What's one ink you tried and was surprised that you like, and what ink did you surprisingly dislike after wanting to try it. This is a good one because I have a little bit of a history um, with ink. In fact, some of my earliest experiences in the fountain pen world were very ink focused. Um, you may have known if you're a loyal Goulet follower um, that uh, for the first year of our business, we didn't even sell pens. It was only ink and paper. So for a while I was pretty obsessed just with ink. Um, but uh, I've had a few that I've tried and really liked, uh, ones that surprised me how much I liked them. One was uh, Giravon Poussière de Lune. Um, and anything kind of in that color family, like the dusty purples, Roaring Klingner, uh, Salix, or sorry, Roaring Klingner, Scabiosa, Salix is a blue, Scabiosa, anything in that, that range, Dimine Dampson, it was never anything that was like, always, you know, appealing to me in, in general life, this dusty purple, but something about it on paper, I just really liked it, I don't know why, the readback is really good, it's very pleasing to the eyes. Uh, another one was Rover and Klingner Alt Goldgrün, which again, this kind of like olive pea green, not my vibe for most things, but the shading on it is so intense. Um, and it's a very, very pleasing color. 
uh, in its own right. And that's kind of the same boat with Noodler's Apache Sunset. Now, of course, I'm, I'm a big proponent of Apache Sunset, but again, that's because of the intense shading. And that one is a big color shifting almost uh, kind of component to it between the red, the orange, and the yellow. Um, but it's the intense shading that I like both of those inks for. Another one that I was kind of surprised, and both of these would actually fit into it, would be uh, Diamine Graphite and then Noodler's Lexington Gray. Again, gray inks, they really kind of look like pencil, uh, especially Diamine Graphite. It, it doesn't even look like ink on the page. It looks like you wrote in a pencil. But I don't know, something about it just, it looks really cool. And like to have a really smooth feeling of a fountain pen nib on paper, but then have it look like a graphite pencil was just, that was one thing I know in the initial reaction. I haven't actually used that ink in a long time, but I remember when I first used it that first time, it was like, wow. It just really gave me that wow impression. Um, and then Lexington Gray, same kind of thing, actually is pretty decent shading and it's a permanent gray, which is not all that common. So I remember being surprised how well it performed and how good it looked in terms of its shading and properties for being a permanent ink too. So those both uh, were really encouraging to me. And then uh, as far as ones that let me down, the biggest ink letdown story I have was actually the first ink that I ever used because I knew nothing about fountain pens when I first started. And I was at the DC Pen Show in 2009 and I bought an ink, I believe it was from Swisher Pens, if you remember them. Um, and they had a table set up. They were swabbing. They were like real-time swabbing samples. So I, you know, like, like you all probably mostly, um, I didn't know what any one color was different from the other aside from what the, the ink was named, you know, because especially I was, at a, I was at a show, so there were no, there was no swab shop, there was no, you know, website or anything that I could look at the colors. It was just a table full of ink boxes that all looked identical, especially because that's what Diamine was doing at the time. And so I'm like, I don't know, what's the difference between Midnight and China Blue <laughs> or whatever? And I thought China Blue sounds pretty cool. I didn't know that it was like, a pastel -y kind of blue. So I picked China Blue and they were giving away a free 30 mil bottle with the purchase of their, their full size bottle. So I bought a full size bottle of China Blue and then I got Midnight as the Dimine um, 30 mil that came along with it. So I get home, I'm really excited. I've never inked a fountain pen before in my life. So I go to ink it up, I barely know what I'm doing. I get the ink in the pen somehow. I go to use it for the first time and I immediately start to write with it and the thing that really caught me off guard, I left this part out, but I was at the, the show and they were doing Q-tip swabs. So they did a Q-tip swab of China Blue. And I looked at it and it was still completely wet and it looked nice and dark and saturated. And I was like, oh yeah, that's what I want. Then of course, I didn't know that it lightens up when it dries, especially on a Q-tip when you really dump it on. It looks very different when you first dump on a completely saturated Q-tip and then you're using like a fine nib and writing and then it dries, it looks way lighter. Uh, and so I did that, I wrote with it and it looked, and it looked pretty okay. I was like, oh, it's not quite as dark. And then it dried and I was like, oh, I really didn't want like a, a dusty light blue. I really wanted a deep, dark, saturated blue. So I remember my very first fountain pen using experience was, wow, this writes really nicely. Oh crap, this color is not anything that I like. And I was like, I don't ever wanna use this color again. And I knew, I was like, I'm never gonna use this color again. So that was actually a very formative experience for me in um, thinking about the swab shop and then thinking about ink samples because I had draw upon my own experience and my own emotional um, memory of what it was like to go through that as a pen newbie. Um, and at the time that was not a, a common way that things were done. And so I felt inspired to do that. Of course, Rachel actually did most of the, the heavy lifting on making those things happen, but um, that's initially what was the spark that caused that. So without that specific experience, who knows? Maybe never would have created those two tools. You never know. Um, but anyway, I did like Diamond Midnight a lot better. However, the first time I went to fill from that little plastic tall 30 mil bottle, I accidentally knocked it over and dumped half the ink all over my kitchen countertop. <laughs> so I was really just like on my game that day. So technically the second inking I ever did, I spilled half the bottle all over the thing. And the first one I inked it. And then I, I, I did, I never inked up China Blue ever again. I think it's been reformulated in the last four years or so um, since that. This would have been, gosh, this would have been a long time ago. Nine, over nine years ago that that happened, nine and a half years ago um, that I first used that. And I still have that bottle of China Blue over there in the 
in the gold box. If you remember, that's what Diamine's boxes used to be gold. Um, that's what I had. So anyway, that was very formative. Uh, a couple others that are just way less of a story to tell, and you're probably like, good, that was long. Uh, one would be Diamine Autumn Oak. It's a really popular in color, and I want to like it, but it's just not my jam. It's just not my jam. I don't know what it is, but Autumn Oak, I just don't like it. It's, it's not, it doesn't shade enough for me. It like soaks into the paper a little too much, spreads a little bit, I don't know. It's in the color to me, it's like, is it orange, is it brown? I don't really know what it wants to be. It's not for me. So as much as everybody loves it, and it's a really popular ink, I was, I was wanting to love it, and I just didn't, and that's okay. Uh, another one, oh, this one does have actually have a story, um, Pelican Edelstein Sapphire. So this was a letdown for me, and this was a lesson in setting expectations because uh, at the time, again, I didn't really know a lot about, especially premium inks. And this was a time when there really weren't a lot of premium inks. You know, Pilot had kind of just come out with a Roshizuku, or maybe they hadn't even come out with a Roshizuku yet. But Pelican was coming out with their Edelstein inks. Um, there was no Lamy Crystal ink. There was no Karen Dosh fancy ink. There was no, um, I'm trying to think of all the other premium inks that are out there now. Um, yeah, there just weren't a lot of, of these like higher end inks. There was no like Jerobon 1670 had maybe just come out. Um, the, the Rouge Hematite. Um, but there weren't, weren't a lot of premium inks out at the time. So Pelican was announcing they were coming out with this full line of sapphire, you know, these, uh, these jewel toned inks, you know, the Edelstein. And I just like really built it up in my head. And of course I had no swab. I had no indication of what the colors might be other than seeing the kind of like digitally rendered, you know, marketing materials. And, and they hyped this ink up for a long time. Like it took them a while to release it. And it was, I think a year and a half that we found out about it. And then it finally came out to be. And I inked it up for the first time. I was expecting it to be, again, a deep saturated jewel tone blue. And it was like almost the exact same of the Diamond China blue that I dislike so much. Um, I'm very picky with my blues, I guess. Uh, and, and it was so funny because I remember I was at a friend's house and I was like, oh, I'm gonna video record my first time using this new Edelstein Sapphire. I just bought my Holy Grail pen, which is a Pelican M800 with a 1.5 stub nib, which at the time stubs were like all that I used. I'd never used one of those nibs before. And I went to use it and I saw that ink and I was just like, oh man. And it's so like somewhere out there, I don't even know where the raw video footage is, is me using that Edelstein Sapphire and then just being like totally bummed out because it wasn't the color that I was expecting it to be. Completely my own fault in a matter of setting my own expectations. Um, but I never did release that video because I don't think it would have been very entertaining <laughs> to see me inking up and then get super disappointed about my own personal preference of a color. Though, I don't know, maybe that'll end up being like the white whale of a video that you all would love to see one day. I should, I should dig around and see if I can find that thing somewhere. If I even kept it, I don't know. Uh, and then another one that I have is Pelican Brilliant Brown. Not to pick on Pelican here, just so happens these two stick out in my mind. Um, Pelican Brilliant Brown, nothing really against the ink. Um, and in fact, if you look at our, um, our website, I think we call it Brilliant Brown, but then the swab of it says Pelican Brown. And it was kind of an inside joke around Goulet here for a long time. In fact, Drew will remember it because he's been here since those garage days, um, that I refused to, to write the name Brilliant Brown because I was like, there's nothing brilliant about this brown. <laughs> And so it became kind of like a stubborn internal per personal preference kind of thing. I was like, I'm not gonna call it Brilliant Brown. I'm just gonna call it Brown. And it is a little confusing because I think on the box it's called, I can't remember, on the box and the bottle, one says Brown and one says Brilliant Brown. They're inconsistent. But either way, I was like, if I had the option, I'm just gonna call it Brown because it's not brilliant. <laughs> oh goodness, I'm sorry, Pelican. I love you all, I really do. That, that's, this is going back. Uh, a ways here, a ways back. All right, that's it for uh, for the ink stuff. Uh, for my ink preferences there, I'd love to know which ones you've had the same experience with too. It won't be the question of the day, but please share your own experiences. And of course, I love all fountain pen ink, really. I, I had a hard time digging up ones that I like, there's nothing that I truly hate. This is ones that where it's more a matter of like, I got my expectations built up and then was let down because of myself. All right, Gregory D on Facebook, asked, how important is it to have lubricating or eel properties to an ink and a piston filler over time? So what Gregory's talking about, if you're not familiar, so Noodlers has a series of ink called Eel, which the eel is, you know, eels are slippery, and these inks have added lubrication to them. 
Um, another one that I don't know if it's the same lubricant or exact same purpose or whatever, but the only other brand that I know that specifically says they have like added lubricant or whatever, added stuff to their to their ink is Monteverde. They have that ITF technology. Now theirs is different. They don't advertise that it's for use in a piston pen, um, but theirs they advertise that it will keep from drying out in the pen longer. Okay, and that's why their their stuff is. So I don't know if it's the same technology or chemicals or whatever it is, um, but I just know that those are the only two that really say anything specifically about even that genre of lubrication. Um, there are certainly some that are drier and wetter than others, but none of the manufacturers really like say whether they are or not. They just kind of make them and then we are left to uh, assume one thing or another based on our experiences with them. So um, Nathan, when he developed these Noodler's inks, he really wanted to do it, especially for vintage pens, um, ones that, uh, maybe vintage, I shouldn't say vintage, but for, for classic pens that um, were not easily disassembled. Of course, Nathan with his Noodler's pens makes them to be easily disassemblable. Not all pens are like that. And he wanted to make it so that if you had a piston filling pen, you know, i.e. like a Mont Blanc or something like that, um, where you need special tools to take it apart and whatnot. He's like, rather than, um, you know, having to get these special tools or send it in for repair to have it, um, you know, re-lubricated, the piston, uh, he says you just use these more lubricated inks and the ink itself will lubricate the piston over time and you won't have to get it, you know, fixed and all that stuff, for that reason, at least. Um, you know, is it, uh, is, it, is it actually effective is the question. And uh, the truth is I haven't done any scientific testing to know. I've kind of talked to some people and there's some people that definitely prefer it, but there's not, there's not such a clear distinction between, oh my gosh, it makes all the difference of my pen or not. It's kind of more of like a, yeah, obviously there's a difference in these inks because they flow wetter. The dry time is a little longer on these. Um, so there's clearly a difference in the ink as to exactly how much of a difference it makes with your piston. I don't exactly know. Nathan may have a little better idea, but um, I think some of it is like, yeah, with added lubrication, um, it's bound to help, right? Um, of course, I know others who like kind of dispute that directly against Nathan, um, you know, but it's hard to say. I haven't had a lot of feedback or experiences that really say that it's necessarily amazing, bad, or otherwise. And I think honestly, a lot of the attention around the eel inks is, you know, some of them are just really nice colors, <laughs> like um, uh, green cactus eel and, um, oh gosh, what's the, there's a magenta one that Rachel really loves that I'm failing to remember the name of it. I'll remember it later after this video is done. Um, but I want to say Saguaro wine, but that's not the one, obviously, because it's eel. I'm failing to remember it. Anyway, so, you know, I think a lot of times is people are just using it more for the color. And of course, there's like blue, there's blue eel. Is there a huge difference? I like Noodler's blue and think it works great. Blue eel, is there much of a difference? Not a, not a whole ton. Um, so um, I think your guess is kind of as good as mine as to how much of a difference it actually makes. Um, so I'd kind of love to hear if you've had any experience one way or other with these particular uh, inks, if you think it actually helps for you. But either way, it's, it's definitely not in a situation where I'm like, oh, you're using that pen, you, you have to use this eel ink. No, you can use it if you want to, don't if you don't. All right, now I got a few business questions here, and I think I have three business questions. I think there's six questions total. Oh, I just felt like with the, with the fire and the, the sweater and the whole thing, I, I felt like, you know, I should just go with more with the book. Um, so I actually printed out my Q&A questions this week um, instead of using a laptop, so. Still getting used to that. I wanted to honestly like two fingers swipe to scroll my reading when I first sat down and did it. Anyway, oh, uh, Lord help me. All right, a couple business questions. So one is from Samantha K on Facebook. Samantha says, Brian, I'm soon to be transition a, a transitioning service member. As I complete my service to our country, I'm having to set myself ready to enter, get myself ready to enter the civilian workforce again. As a business owner, what are some key things you look for in your future employees? And does it come more from their resume or their interviews? Well, Samantha, first off, I wanna say thank you for your service. You didn't say specifically what country you're from, but if you, whatever country it is, 
thank you. Um, and if especially if it's in the U.S., thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, a very short answer for your entire question is fit, 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 fit. Uh, it's really all about fit. I personally kind of hate resumes. I think they're a necessary evil, but they really don't tell you anything about how much of a fit somebody's going to be in your company or how good of a job they're going to do. All it really tells you is do they have the basic qualifications? Maybe. Do they say they have the basic qualifications? And do they have the ability to put a resume together? That's pretty much all you gain from it. So we use it as a step in our interview process, but I would never hire anybody based purely off their resume. And it it warrants so little in a decision for me that oftentimes I don't even look at the full resume of somebody. I will do that if it's like a direct report of mine, but it, it matters so little to me. It's, it's something that our HR director, uh, Jen, will look at and I will seldom even look at it and I'll just hold conversations with my team about their relevant work experience and stuff. Um, so to me, it doesn't really matter much because you can so easily fudge or lie or embellish or whatever um, and people do that all the time. But it does act as a basic first pass of, wow, this person wants to be a copywriter and they can't even spell their name correctly on their resume or they turn in their resume and they put the wrong name of the company, of, of like the company they're applying for on it. And you're like, wow, okay. So their attention to detail is clearly not there. Or we've had some where it's been like a creative role, like a photographer or something like that. And you look at the way that they've like tried to design their resume and you're like, what the heck are they doing here? Like that can indicate some things, but pretty much you can only do bad on your resume. You're never gonna like get the job because of your resume. All you have to do is lose it before you even get it. Um, so interviews matter much more for me. But then again, I'm more of a people person um, and I'm better at reading people in person than I am on paper. Um, so for us, we go progressively deeper and deeper. We have a multi-step interview process here. That's not necessarily common, um, but for us, that's what we do to get a better understanding of fit. Again, all back to fit. So I'm not gonna go much deeper into our process, excuse me, there, because that's not necessarily relevant to what you're looking for. You're looking more on the other side of it, like you're going out, you're seeking um, employment from different people. So I'm gonna give you some direct pointers based on what I think um, should matter to you. So uh, for one, do your homework, you know, actually give a crap about the company that you're applying for, um, which sounds crazy, but you'd be amazed. Um, read the dang job description and look at their website. So you would be absolutely stunned if had people that have applied for social media or marketing positions, and then we go to interview them and they've never looked at our website. They have no idea what presence we have on social media. And I'm like, this is the job you're applying for and you don't even have awareness when you go to talk to us? Like, no, you're not even gonna make it through the end of this phone call, sorry. Um, so, gotta pay attention to those things. There's so much information there at your disposal. It means so much and you will stand out far more than you will on a resume if you've done a little bit of homework and you understand something about what the company does when you talk to them. That will make you stand out. Um, Self-awareness is absolutely key. If you say things in your interview that aren't really you, but you just think it's what somebody wants to hear, then you're fooling yourself as much as them as to whether or not you're actually gonna be happy working there long term. If you're just looking for a six month holdover job and you just gotta get by, fine. But if you're looking for, okay, I want meaningful employment here, which I'm guessing you probably do, um, really pay attention to your own fit in the company and their fit for you. Um, if someone won't hire you because of who you actually are, um, then that's a good thing actually because you wouldn't have been successful or enjoyed it there much anyway. Um, you should still bring the best version of yourself. Doesn't mean you should show up in pajamas and flip flops because you're like, well, this is who I am. I'm most comfortable when I'm in this. You still wanna put your best foot forward because um, I'm really surprised in the interview process for the better. Um, <laughs> you want to show that you're capable of presenting yourself well and being courteous and you know if you just come in and you're like covered in food stains and dropping f-bombs and all that that might be appealing in some settings and maybe if that really is true to who you are and you have no intention of changing under any circumstance then that's how you should go and if somebody likes that then you know you can probably be an internet celebrity of some kind but uh, maybe you wouldn't want to do that if you're going to work for the state government or something like that. Um, if someone only wants to hear the things that they want and they don't want to hear you actually be who you are, 
then you probably won't love it much there anyway. And you're going to have to always kind of put on that interviewee kind of facade, which you're going to get really sick of over time. And then it's probably going to turn into a passive aggressive kind of situation and you're not going to be happy. And then this is not going to be good and you're not going to last. So try to, again, fit. Um, the interview process thing to remember is that um, as much as they're interviewing you, you're also interviewing them. And I always tell that to candidates as they're coming through our process. I'm like, look, this interview goes two ways. You need to assess whether this is a good fit for you, just like we need to assess if you're a good fit for us. So keep that in mind. Um, do your homework, study them, study the company and the position that you're applying for, and be very articulate about your qualifications, your own goals, and why you and the company are a good fit together. One of the most annoying things for me as an employer, when somebody comes in, all they do is talk about why they're a good, like why they're qualified and the benefits that they're going to get from being employed here. Like if they talk about how like, oh, this is so close to my house, you know, the PTO is gonna be great because I can go do yada, yada, yada. I think this job is gonna challenge me mentally and I'm really excited, I love pens and I just wanna be around them all the time. I'm like, that's fine but what are you actually going to be doing to contribute to our cause? Did you even look at our mission statement? Do you even understand what we're trying to do here? Those are really important things to think about and any good and meaningful and thoughtful employer is going to want to hear more of what it is that you can do for them and what you can contribute to the greater cause that they're trying to do. It's not, it shouldn't be a one-sided relationship. It should be both ways. But the more you can articulate what that two-way relationship is gonna be, the better it is. Um, obviously, you'd be more successful at a place, probably, that likes veterans. I'm assuming that you're, a, you know, maybe military or whatever, whatever service that you're in. Um, so I would maybe look for places that that's a part of their culture, is they're very uh, kind towards uh, veterans. Uh, and there may be programs available to help you you know, get placed or trained or, or otherwise get some help in finding work. You know, I don't know specifically what those are, um, but I know that there's programs like that out there. And then last thing I'll say for your specific circumstance is reach out to your own personal network. You, um, who you know definitely matters and you might be surprised what kind of connections you can make and what kind of um, leads you can get on companies that would be interesting to work for based on people that you know who actually work at various places. Or maybe, maybe somebody you know, got out of the, the service 10 years before you and you reach out to them, they've had a couple different jobs and maybe they made a connection, they know somebody and they think you'd be a great fit somewhere. Um, you know, that could be uh, really, really meaningful, and especially if you have kind of an in, a connection at a given company, that really can make a huge difference sometimes. So, um, you know, I would really think about it like, don't think about when you're looking for a job as like in between jobs. Basically, if you're looking for your next step in your career, your full-time job is finding your next job. So you should really think about it like get up in the morning, get up at the regular time, get dressed, work on your resume, send out, make phone calls, go visit people, whatever it is, go on interviews, reach out to your personal network, talk to somebody, have lunch with somebody, reach out to everybody on Facebook. Like you should be thinking, I gotta put in eight hours a day to try to find my next career. And if you do that, you're gonna find something way better than, well, you know, I was kind of waiting for a call today, so maybe I'll just, you know, catch up on, Game of Thrones or something while I'm, I don't know, it's thrown out as an example, but you know, really work at it and you'd be surprised the difference that can make. Cool? Thank you. So, thank you for your service. All right, Josh R on Facebook. <clears throat> this is a good one. Would you ever price match with other pen sites? I really like Goulet's website, selection, shipping, etc. but sometimes there is a rather huge price difference that I just cannot justify. All right, Josh, let's get into it here. So this is the whole thing with retail, right? Price especially seems to be rather commoditized. You know, you look at a product and you think, well, it's the same pen that I can get at all these different places. So really the biggest differentiator is price because it's like, it's right there. You feel that it's in your wallet, right? Um, but there's a lot behind the website, selection, shipping, et cetera, that you mentioned um, that has actual costs and has some, some real sacrifices that are associated to them. And part of what you don't probably realize at the onset, especially with online retail, you know, it's relatively straightforward to put up a website, list something, you have no idea the behind the scenes stuff that is behind any of the companies that you're necessarily shopping for. Um, 
but there's 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 a lot that goes into it. Um, we try to be really fair and competitive, not even charging full list price on something, especially like really expensive pens and whatnot. We try to stay competitive, especially within the US market. So one thing that I'm going to make a little bit of a leap and assume here is that when you're talking about a rather huge price difference, I generally know about what other retailers are charging. And I wanna make sure that we're fair and, and equitable in what we're charging. Um, but where I do hear a lot of feedback and where I witness myself that there are huge price differences. A um, lot of times that's gray market stuff that's overseas dealers that are selling into the US, not through the same distribution channel we have, not authorized, not um, warranted products. So that's where um, stuff gets really challenging because it's basically, we're, we're not all playing by the same rules, so to speak. So, you know, I don't wanna turn this into a really defensive position against that because I've talked about that in previous Q and A's. And look, it's, it's an open market, right? Like. If you can charge whatever you are from wherever you are, that's that's totally up to you. Um, and there's nothing like against the law about doing any of that kind of stuff. So um, it just gets to a place where it's like, you know, if you're just like if you go into a physical brick and mortar store and you're talking to the sales rep and you're using all the various pens and you're soaking up all their knowledge and experience and then you leave and you go buy it somewhere else because it's cheaper, you can totally do that. But if everybody does that, that store is gonna be out of business and then that's not going to be there anymore. And that has happened to a lot of brick and mortar. And um, I know that's, that's part of the challenge being an online retailer. I I'm not a big fan of showrooming personally um, because I think, you know, just like if you are, um, you know, wanting to support an artist, you know, you should pay as much as you can afford to that artist. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of like Ryan Crusack and Jake Weidman and all them. And I know it was interesting. I was talking, this is completely unrelated, but, you know, I was talking to Ryan Cruzak and like he was, you know, um, his daughter wanted to buy a piece of Jake Weidman's art and um, refused to pay any kind of a discount because Ryan Cruzak was like, if you're buying from an artist, you know, because he's an artist, he's like, you should always pay full price because that artist lives and dies by what you pay them. You know, it's kind of the same thing. Like, you know, obviously with a retailer, it's a little different because we're not necessarily creating said products, but we are creating and experience and customer service. And there's a lot of other things that we are creating that's unique. So it, it is kind of just an interesting place for us to be in um, when you compare to other retailers. Um, and it's a challenge being on the internet because basically anybody could be a competitor. You know, you can have on eBay and somebody that doesn't have a business, so to speak, I'm getting warm, I think this fire is getting toasty. Um, you know, you can have, um, you know, a situation like uh, like you're talking here, I've seen some of the rather huge price differences you're talking about with, with say, an overseas dealer. Well, they might be buying through a completely different distribution channel or who knows how they're getting the products where they are, um, but I've seen them for sale cheaper than my cost as a retailer. So if I was to sell them at their cost, I would actually lose money on every pen. I mean, just flat out on the sale of the pen. So it would be a terrible business decision for me to sell it at that price. Now, if that happens a lot and they have a good stock, oftentimes they don't have great stock or there's sketchy situations that can happen. Um, but uh, if I am, you know, if there's a regular supply of it having at that low of a price, that's going to uh, diminish the value of the brand as a whole. Uh, because if there's that much of a price disparity from one part of the country or one part of the US or the world to another, um, it's gonna make it very difficult to sell in those more expensive markets. And sometimes the US ends up being one of those more expensive markets, sometimes it's the other way around. Um, but um, it all kind of evens itself out over time. So we just won't sell as many of that particular brand. And there's a reason that some brands we just don't do as well with um, for those reasons. Um, but getting out of some of the nitty gritty details there, fundamentally, talking about like as a business owner, I have to set the vision for our company and what our core values are and our why behind what we do. Now I'll preface this by saying, I've been listening to a lot of Simon Sinek and his book Start With Why recently, which is a phenomenal book. I've read it multiple times and I'm rereading it again. Um, we just finished our 2019 offsite planning and we we're talking about purpose and vision and some very ethereal kind of stuff. And I felt inspired to reread Simon's book. Um, so I'll be drawing upon some of that for this, this Q and A question here. Um, so I want to prove the business can be personal, right? That's part of part of our deal here at Goulet. And I really want to carry on fountain pens to the next generation. You know, when I went to the DC show in 2009 and I saw it was all gray hairs inside that building, um, I said, dang, how is anybody new gonna get into fountain pens? 
Like, how's that going to happen? People that didn't grow up with fountain pens in school, um, how are they going to find out about them? And I was like, it's got to be on the internet, and it's got to be uh, education-based and with social media. So we very leaned very heavily into that. That informs a lot of what we do. Uh, the challenge of that is it takes a tremendous amount of time. <laughs> it takes a lot of resources, equipment, people, all these types of things uh, in order to do things that way. Um, but yeah, we don't charge for any of that stuff. So it's all built into basically, you know, the margin of our products, which we're not charging a premium. Um, you know, there are some, some price disparities again with those, you know, um, partic you know, particular places, but largely we try to stay pretty fair um, with most of our competition. Um, but uh, that is a, a core part of what we do is that education focused. Um, so we use values like what we've developed to determine uh, how we should operate and what that looks like for us. Um, so Simon Sinek has a concept called the golden circle and I am going to try to show you what that is right here. Let me see what I have inked up in handy. I must have a fountain pen inked up here. Okay, so the golden circle is a very simple concept. So I will draw it for you right now. It's uh, actually a set of three circles that all surround each other. Forgive me if you're using grid paper, it's gonna make it a little harder to see, but this is Simon Sinek's concept of the golden circle. So the outer circle is your what, what you do, how you operate. You know, this would be like, we're a retailer, we sell online. How? These are more of the um, logistics. I guess this would be like, we sell fountain pens. How would be, we're an online retailer, we have really good service, um, we have lots of educational videos. Why? The why is the most golden part of the circle, I guess. The why is the most important part. And the problem is, most businesses, when they're operating, they try to tell you what their what and their how is. But few of them talk about their why, or maybe even understand what their own why is. Um, so that's the whole thing. His book is called Start With Why. It's based off this concept of the golden circle. And uh, it really informs the what and how um, the company uh, uses to operate. So one of my favorite quotes from him is that people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. I love that quote from Simon. Um, so if you think about like, Walmart, Target, Amazon, these are all retailers that built their companies on a low cost model. Um, so low cost and price matching and things like that, that is a part of their why. You know, they wanted to disrupt or they wanted to, you know, in Walmart's case, they wanted to be uh, a retailer for the everyman and, uh, you know, Target wanted to be a, a discount, um, you know, bringing style at lower prices, these types of things. Um, so they all have a slightly different um, variation, but it's it's built on kind of a lower cost model. Um, so it informs everything else that they do, right? Um, we don't have a low cost built into our why. Um, it's not at the core of what we do. And if we were to um, start doing a lot of low cost activity, it would be in reaction to what other people are doing and it would start to then feel incongruent with our why. Our team would get confused, you would get confused as to why we were doing that because it's not at the core of who we are. Um, business being personal, which is a core part of our why, um, that requires more humans, more human interaction, more time spent, um, slightly less automation in some ways. Um, you know, we take time to do personal touches, um, you know, like our slightly, slightly ridiculous amount of care in our shipping, um, the handwritten thank you notes, um, you know, being accessible, the engagement that we have on social media and these types of things, that all takes time and people. Um, so we take really good care of our team. You know, we have a huge focus. I'm a big fan, sort of like, you know, Southwest Airlines or Zappos. You know, I'm, I'm very much of the mentality, like, my number one priority is to take care of my team. The team will then take care of you all as our customers. Um, so that's pretty much how it works. Um, where was I? Um, so we spend a really good amount of time uh, on education and engagement, which is a huge financial as well as an opportunity cost for us um, because it's part of our why. So it's not gonna look the same at other companies because they're not us. Uh, lowering cost, that's a reaction to something others are doing 
and it detracts from our ability to live out our why. So that's why we don't do it. Uh, we'd rather lose some business due to undercutting or price competition um, than to have all of the lowest price business and then have to cut out all of the things that make us us. Does that make sense? So the time that I'm spending here sitting down and shooting a video with you, I'm not directly compensated for that time. You know what I mean? And if I was to start price matching everywhere and I lost a lot of margin on our product, so to speak, then I all of a sudden then wouldn't have the time to justify doing something like this um, because I'd have to make it up in other ways. Um, so the short answer is that price matching isn't necessarily bad, um, but it's not us and it's not central to our mission. Uh, and then I'll close it out with a quote from Seth Godin that says, the problem with the race to the bottom is that you just might win. Um, what I've seen in the fountain pen industry um, is that individual retailers who have gone towards a price matching model uh, have not stuck around very long. Either they're not that seriously into the business, you know, they might be an independent seller on eBay or Amazon or something like that. They have low price products, but their stock is sporadic and you don't really know who they are and you don't really get a lot of service support. Um, but uh, they either don't stick around or it's another retailer who maybe is starting to go that way and it's kind of a sign of the beginning of the end for them. Because the problem is if you start price matching as a retailer and then you have no profit margin, you have no money to then reinvest into building your business again. And it's only a matter of time before it all gets uh, kind of dries on the dries on the husk, so to speak. So there you go. I guess the best way that I can say is that, um, you know, of course, you have to make your own decisions as a as a customer, as a consumer, as to which is best for you. I hold no judgment against anybody. If you want to buy um, from somebody else, you want to, you want to watch our videos, you want to talk to our team and all that, you know, obviously be courteous, but if you're going to, if you're going to watch all of our stuff and then always buy elsewhere, I'm realistic that that happens sometimes. But I also bank on the fact that there are so many people, so many of you out there who, um, will still support us and will be really loyal to us because of all the extra stuff that we do. I'm just banking that there's enough of you all who will support us so that uh, we can continue to do what we do. So it's been working so far for nine years, and uh, I think we're going to keep at it because it's very fulfilling work to us, and it's a huge part of who we are. All right, last question I have for this week. This is from Shiloh M. on Facebook. Do you ever wonder if Goulet pens could get so big that it would lose its Goulet-ness? And I like this question, Shiloh, because it builds nicely upon the last one. So the short answer on this one it won't be short answer, sorry. I like to talk about business, so I'm just gonna go on. Um, I don't wonder if Goulet pens would get so big. Uh, I know that that is um, naturally going to be the evolution of what can happen. And so I think about it very intentionally. As we grow, as Rachel and I, as the founders, have our hands less and less of all the day to day, um, it's impossible for it to maintain that same level of goulayness because the two goulays who started the company are involved in fewer of the total activities. Therefore, it's impossible. The only way to help with that is to be extremely clear about our company's why, our mission, our vision, what we're trying to do, the values that we seek, and to preach that and preach that and preach that. Um, I think size is definitely a factor. Obviously, we have 39 people in our company right at this moment. It'd be very different with 3,900 or 39,000. Um, so obviously, the messaging and the consistency at which you have to run a company to maintain a certain feel um, is going to be very different depending on the size. You know, and. Uh, we have kind of slowed down in terms of number of people that we've been hiring recently because we've had a lot of efficiencies uh, in terms of our operation. So it has been a little easier. There was there was some years that we had a couple of years ago where we would double in size and people in a given year. That gets really difficult to um, maintain your same culture uh, when you when you grow that rapidly um, because there's so many new people around and there's just things change. Excuse me from a organizational structure and a communication structure, um, it gets really difficult to do things the same way and have the same outcome. Um, so you have to constantly be thinking about that, especially me, I'm, I'm the CEO, I'm really the, the one who thinks about this kind of stuff. Rachel's an operator, she's great at business processes and th these types of things. She supports me in this kind of stuff that we're talking about here, but 
wow, uh, she does not love living in this space too long. <laughs> she gets rather uncomfortable, and that's fine, because uh, it's more my jam. Um, so size is a factor. It could certainly contribute to a company losing their sense of who they are. Building upon Simon Sinek's golden uh, circle concept, uh, if you take the golden circle, which is, you know, like the three, three concentric circles here, um, and you look at it as a side view, um, kind of like that, if that makes sense. It's actually a, a cone and not just a circle, okay? So, mm, there we go. So, this is from the, the top view, if you will, and this is the side view. Um, so, thinking about that, as a business owner, as a founder, it's my job to live in the why all day long. Like, that's where I need to spend a disproportionate amount of my time, especially as the organization grows. So, what ends up happening is this this, um, if you kind of turn it like this and you view it as a megaphone, so like I'm here and I have to be at living at the heart of the why, I have to represent why Goulet Pens does what it does. And I have to preach that out with as much clarity as possible because the rest of the team has got to live that out and has got to um, be that representation to uh, as many people as possible. And the bigger that megaphone gets, if you will, the clearer and more concise that message has to be all the way at the beginning. So that's kind of how I view it. Um, so that's that's my job. That's part of my role is to be super clear about that. Um, so I think there's lots of companies that lose a sense of who they are when the founder starts to flounder or, or leaves, um, especially that's when it's most drastic. Um, and i absolutely realistic that that can happen here. I'm not going to be around forever. I plan to be around for a long time. Um, but if the company grows to a point where I outgrow my own capabilities or my own interests. I mean, I'm really loving this so far, but you're talking 20, 30, 40 years from now? Who knows what can happen, right? Um, my goal is to not just try to hang on to where I am right now, and then that's it. Because if that happens, that's when you bring in a concept that I love in business called the leadership lid, which is a John Maxwell concept. Um, which is the organization will never grow beyond the point that the leader is capable of uh, leading them. So me, as the leader of the Goulet Pen Company, if I am not growing myself, challenging myself, growing in my own capabilities as a leader, uh, then the organization is going to be limited. Uh, and that's where we would start to lose our Goulet-ness, is if the rest of the company starts growing and I don't have the wherewithal to maintain um, my own sensibilities around how the company is running, that's when we would start to um, start to fracture a little bit. And you see that all the time, especially with, with um, founder-run companies. You know, they get, reach a certain size, especially you think about like, you know, founder-run company, they scale it really quickly, they take the company public, and it just gets away from them. And they just kind of lose a complete sense of who they are, what the company is, why it was founded. Um, it becomes very challenging to maintain that. And I don't think we've grown fast enough or to the point where that's a super serious risk, but it is something that's on my mind a lot, is I think we've got a really cool thing going here, and I'm really proud of what we do and why we do it, that I wanna make sure that we maintain that even as we scale and as we grow. I don't wanna grow just for the sake of growth. I wanna grow because I think we have an amazing thing going, and I want more opportunities for my team. I wanna reach more people and get more fountain pens into people's hands. Um, okay, so that is, uh, absolutely something that's on my mind um let's see the fact that i i think that the fact that i recognize that this is not only a potential but almost an inevitability in some fashion um, that i will not live forever um, i do think about it and that puts me way ahead of it because i'm aware of it and i'm thinking about it and then i'm going to be planning for it um, though there's a lot to be work work to be done this is not a perfect process in fact that was one of the topics in the 2019 offsite that we had was Rachel and I are too dependent upon for too many things. We end up being a bottleneck in certain areas. We end up having to use our own intuition to make decisions because we have unclear information for other people to be able to make a call. And so we have to step in on too many things. We wanna be able to build up others and that's a huge thing we're gonna to try to do in 2019. Um, the kind of leadership required for a company or a brand to transcend its founder and then carry on um, is pretty much like pinnacle level leadership stuff. Uh, and really that's my goal. Like the way I look at it is my one metric that matters as the founder of a company. Like it's almost like birthing a child. 
um, in, in not so graphic a fashion, but I mean, if you are starting a company, you're creating an entity, um, an entity that hopefully goes beyond just your efforts. So it's kind of the same thing. You're almost like a parent of your business. So you are birthing an idea, you're creating it, you're raising it, you are then, you know, hiring others into it. And you have to, you can then, it's kind of like it's growing up, you know, it's very similar parallels. And the fact that I've, we had our son, like right at the time that we started Goulet Pen Company, I've seen the parallels and it's just really eerie how, how similar they are. Um, but that's kind of the way I look at it is like, how do you, how do you judge whether you're a good parent? Like, well, did I raise my, did I raise my child well? And did I like not screw them up too bad and they stay alive? Like, okay, I've done a good job as a parent. You know, it's like, if you run a business, then when they move out of the house, like, are they capable of going out on their own? That's the same kind of thing. And you can check in, you can be involved in their lives, but you're not living their life for them. So I think too many, um, founders end up you know, kind of like micromanaging their own businesses and then they stunt it and it can never go beyond and then they burn out and then um, it, they resent it and then it flounders and dies. Uh, that happens a lot, all the time. And I do not want that to be the case with us. Um, so the way I look at it is, um, as a founder, if my company will carry on without me, I've succeeded and if not, I failed. And it's really that black and white. Um, speaking more about like the interim, not so much of that like in the end of my life, what's gonna happen kind of thing. Um, you know, company's growing when I'm still here. It's my goal to ensure that as we grow, that we keep our soul. Like that's one of the core things of what I'm trying to do here. Um, so the why needs to stay consistent. The how and the what of what we do as a Goulet Pen Company, that can change, you know, and that can evolve over time. Um, but the why has to be really articulated and that's what gives us our, our Goulet-ness. Um, you know, we're gonna face challenges with this. Like I think about one of the challenges that we are just right in the middle of right now, and actually has been a challenge ever since the beginning, is our handwritten thank you notes. Um, you know, like these right here that I screwed up the other day. <laughs> if you watch, follow my Instagram, this is one of them. Um, so uh, we do these handwritten thank you notes and we had kind of an interesting evolution just of the handwritten thank you notes. Um, expressing gratitude is one of our core values. So the handwritten thank you notes is one of the ways that we live that out. You know, but however, handwritten thank you notes is not one of our core values. You know, it is the what, or maybe the how, if you will, that, that proves our why of we want to express gratitude as one of our core values. And this is one of the ways that it manifests. The shape and condition of this may change and it may not even be practical to do in its existing form. Um, and that's something that we're revisiting right now even. Um, if you think about like, I'll, I'll tell you the whole evolution. When we first started doing, we've done, we've done a handwritten thank you note since the very first Goulet order that ever shipped out. So nine and a half years, it's been a lot of handwritten thank yous. Um, I used to do a Clairefontaine Triumph A5 tablet sheet. Uh, I would write out a full page, multiple sentences. Dear, I would look at the person's name in the order, Dear Andre, thank you so much for supporting our company. I really hope you enjoy your da 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 da. I would look at what they ordered. Really hope you enjoy your stuff. Right on, Brian Goulet. And I did a wax seal every single order that went out. Now that takes a lot of time and expense between the wax and the tramp and all that kind of stuff. So it was a big time, but we had nothing but time back then when we were first starting the company. It made sense. First 1,700 orders or so that we did, that's what I did. It then became impractical. And I was like, it is not practical. It got to the point where we were getting so many, I was like, I'm spending two hours a day writing thank you notes. This is not the best served use of my time anymore. I could be doing other things. So I then had to scale back the notes. And I actually, it's funny that I think the video is still out there. I think it's called like the hardest decision I've ever had to make or something like that. It's from mid 2010 maybe. Um, and it's, uh, it talks about me having to scale back those handwritten thank you notes, which is just, it's just laughable now. But it was really that important to me back then um, to even change the condition of something like a handwritten thank you note, because it was that core to kind of why we do what we do. Um, but of course we changed it and I was like, oh, this is so much more practical and I never looked back. Um, and then it got to the point where doing, a, doing it written on a separate sheet didn't even make sense anymore. So we started writing it on the packing slip. And then that worked for a while because then it was much more practical and we didn't have to manage separate things. Um, and so we would do it. But then we got to the point where, you know, I couldn't write all the notes anymore. So we had to have other people come in and help. And I would write some and other people would write some. And then I got to the point where it was so big, I wasn't even writing any. Our customer care team was writing all of them. 
But then it got to the point like we were in the holidays, and this was only just a, as of a couple of years ago. Um, we would get into the holidays and the volume would increase so much. We'd have that many more notes to write that all had to be real time signed as suited, and it became a bottleneck for getting orders out the door to you because we had to write the notes on the orders. And I was like, this isn't making sense anymore. We have to change this. So that's when we went to the design cards. And then once we had the design cards, it was like, well, now that we've separated out the physical packing slip from the note writing, we can have other people in the company write notes. And that was like, cool, we can have fulfillment do it. We can have our marketing director do it. We can have me and Rachel do it. You know, we can bring them home and we can write them at home while I watch TV. You know, Rachel and I are going back and rewatching Friends right now. Um, so nice throwback to the 90s, um, which is quite funny. So we'll just like, as we're watching TV, just kind of relaxing, we're just writing thank you notes, you know? It's just a nice way to just like, I feel really good about doing that, especially when it's busy and helping out the team. Um, so right now, that's the form that it's taking. But we're having conversations next year about, is that even sustainable? Like, what would that look like? And I don't, I don't really have an answer yet because it's, it's really kind of a sacred core tenet of kind of, um, you know, expressing gratitude. But I got to think about like, how do we not lose our soul? How do we do something? And it's, it's, it's a relatively small thing, right, in the grand scheme of things. But I spend more time than probably most people would thinking about this kind of stuff is like, okay, if we have to change what this looks like in the future, and I've, we've gone through multiple iterations that I just explained, if we have to change this in the future because of practicality, what is this gonna look like to still maintain the same feeling and still express the same um, goulayness? Um, so it's really, it boils down to thinking about this very question that you asked with pretty much everything in the entire business. You know, everything that goes down from what type of, um, you know, cards are we gonna write? Drew tested out about 50 different types of card stock, I'm not joking, to pick the right one that would show ink. And even that, we're not like 100% happy. It was the best we could find after 50. It was like, all right, this is all we can do. So we found the best one that we could find <laughs> out of the 50 that we had. Um, to find ones that accepted fountain pen ink properly and fit within our budget. Um, so it's that type of intentionality behind what it looks like to live out your why um, that you will notice and feel. Um, yeah, it's like we're intentional about the type of coffee that we drink here. We're intentional about the color of the carpet so that it feels goulet, so that our team, when they come here, they feel very intentional. And they're, you know, I've got a team of 39 people. I'm only one person. You know, I'm not interacting with most of you most of the time. That's all my team. So they have to embody how we live out and be consistent across the whole company so that anybody you interact with, you feel like it's goulet. That does not, that does not happen by accident. That requires a tremendous amount of effort. And it's a huge part of my focus and the responsibility that I hold. So, um, yeah, that pretty much settles me out for today. That's, uh, that's about it. Anyone who's a founder of a company of any size, you gotta be thinking about this kind of stuff because um, it's really important. And if I had one thing to go back and do, I probably would have defined this uh, earlier on because it was about, we had about 20 people in our company before I thought about this kind of stuff, the why and, and um, our mission and values and stuff like that. Um, having it defined earlier on would have made it that much clearer and would have saved us some, some pain along the way. Um, it's all worked out okay uh, over time, but it's, uh, it's really added tremendous benefit since we started doing that. And that's all I got for you for 2018. Um, my question of the week for you this week, if you've been able to stick through the whole Q&A today. Um, my question is, what's the worst interview question that you've ever been asked? Um, there's been some interesting ones. I've, I haven't been asked anything too crazy oddball before, but I remember Rachel went on an interview one time and they asked her if she was a car, what kind of car would she be? And she was like, I don't know, I'm Honda Accord because that's what I drive. She hates doing interviews. She's so pragmatic. <laughs> it's really funny. But it's like, what kind of car? I was like, what are you really deriving from that? I don't know, maybe they had a purpose to it, but um, she thought that was a particularly bad one. So um, I'm very curious if you all have had some very comical ones, thinking about like going out looking for a job, that kind of things. Um, and then my writing prompt for you this week, if you want to pull out your pens and actually write with them, um, write out five things that you love about your current job or your current situation. If you're a student in school or if you're, you know, whatever your, your, your family situation is, um, just write out five things that you love about your current situation because I think it's so easy to, to be thinking about like, oh man, if only I could do da-da-da-da, but I'm a big, big fan of um, 
optimism and gratitude. So uh, be thinking about what you love about where you are. Cool? That's all I got for you this year. It's been an awesome, awesome 2018. We're not completely done. We'll have a little bit more. Um, we'll have right now on Wednesday next week, but not Monday, um, because we'll be closed. And then um, I think, I guess we'll have one more right now for the end of the year on Monday the 20, the 31st. Excuse me. Uh, but I don't know what we're going to do. I haven't thought that far ahead. Um, but uh, we'll not have a Q&A next week. We'll have something else to surprise you. Um, but in the meantime, you can check out a lot of what we talked about here on GoulayPens.com. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, interact with us because um, that's what we're here for. Anyway, I hope you have a very Merry Christmas, uh, very Happy Holidays, Happy New Year if I don't see you before then. Thanks so much for watching and right on.